on an acoustic guitar. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I agree. I agree. Sorry, sir. I'm apologies. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. 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 Okay. Over here, where? Yeah, it's where musicians come in and they, their stuff goes there. All right. So it's just going to sit right there. Thank you. What was your name? I'm Bill Highsmith. I'm his uh, little brother. Okay. Hey, cool. Yeah, yeah two brothers. That's y'all. You'll both get this after you, bro. Every week on the show, Doug, I just say hi. Either comes in or another person comes in and they sit. It's what I call the second chair. So, and their whole purpose is anything I don't ask, or if I leave a hole that doesn't have an answer in it, their job is to listen to what I'm saying and then ask that question and we get the shot to make sure we can catch everything about you. Cool. Right now, there's a show running while we're taping this already. Right, right. 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 It's being ran from another room, so that's what he's having to go handle real quick because he's the producer for all the shows. Yeah, yeah. Those are pretty nice digs. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Doug. Right. There you go. Then we're gonna get a whole bunch of pictures in here. It's pretty cool here, man. Real cool. Did you expect this? Um, well, after you told me, I was expecting better than the digs over. All the right, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. This is exceedingly fine. Mighty fine jigs. Alright. The myth that's been shielded is the only picture you'll ever get is from the back right here. Yeah. So everybody's like, who's that guy? It's like, this is the myth. It's going to sound even better. <laughs> All right, whenever you're ready. All right, stand by. I just forgot what you were talking. Okay, stop. Last time you were. Way back. Here we go, stand by. And whenever you're ready, Bill. Welcome back to the KBA 103.9 Hour Show. Hour Brought to you by Lakeside. Yeah, okay. Alright, stand by. Alright, stand by. Alright, when you're ready. <laughs> Welcome back to the KBA 103.9 FM Home Growing Hour. Brought to you by Lakeside Pond, the Pottery Barn. And today we have a special guest. Pottery Ranch. Pottery Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> See, there is Are a we glad it's over? Uh, I need to tell you about it. Shopping for your wife. <laughs> else to do. There wasn't any lakes to fish in, that's for sure. If y'all know where 
I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, you know, today's studio, we have my younger brother, Bill Heisman, sitting with us. I want to welcome back to the show. But we actually, uh, for a time, we were growing up living in a little town out there called Ira Ann. West my Texas. goodness, okay. yeah. Yeah, right. In Rankin area. That's that literally the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah it, it was. was. the middle of nowhere. It was literally in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you know, uh, I had the distinct pleasure of uh, being there in the third grade, eighth and ninth grade. And uh, it, it was an experience, so. Okay. okay. So, tell us a little bit more about, you know, you're, you know, now 13. You're uh, starting to make some money at the music. Was it like played at the local dance halls, school talent shows, or anything like that? Boys clubs, uh, sock hops, uh, private parties. Um, let's see. Then they kind of got into uh, doing fraternities, you know, traveling around. I love a uh, what was the Saul Ross, which is in uh, Alpine. Played some crazy parties down there. And up through high school, and then kind of fast forward, I, I got picked up by a fella that ended up with a studio uh, in Fort Worth, and uh, he ended up having a, a heck of a lot of uh, clients uh, advertising, you know, jingles. Yes, sir. And writing and producing jingles. jingles. And, and uh, that, that, I did that for longer than I really should have. <laughs> but it was, it was good money, and it was fun being in the studio, whether you were singing about toothpaste or, <laughs> or uh, you know, airlines or airline uh, companies or, you know, you're getting some national spots and some multi-regional spots and it was good money. It was hard to leave, but I did. Well, was there, was there any memories from the, uh, the writing the genome part of your life in the, in the music? Uh, any major brains that you did? Uh, I'll just ask that question because that is... Well, some of them don't exist anymore. There was Schlitz beer, it was big. Brand of Airlines got me a really big payday. Um, success, rice, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the big paydays, Maybelline, cosmetics, etc. You know, just off the top of my head there. Good. Doug, that's amazing. Out of, out of all the guests that's been on the show, you're, you're the first one that even brought up about doing jingles. You know, so I, I just want to reiterate to everybody, everybody's listening out there, um, you know, there is other avenues for work and you just showed right there with the jingles part. So, let's Doug, let's go back to that very first guitar you had. You're talking about the one that your dad got you. The one I wish I still had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how, how long did you have that? Did you write any of those jingles with that in the guitar? No, uh, I, I, uh, I traded that guitar away for, uh, I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I, I got kind of a jazz guitar and, and uh, it wasn't really suited for uh, so I, until I got a Les Paul sometime later, uh, I lost that guitar, guitar early on. That's kind of the story of that one. I, like I say, I wish I had it back. But um, there was a, uh, I wrote jingles on piano and uh, driving in the car, mowing the lawn. Um, they, they come up, all kind of you know, creative stuff comes up in, in your dreams even. And and, uh, and then probably mostly uh, a lot, heck, heck of a lot sitting with a guitar. And there's been so many guitars in my life until my guild came along, 56 guild, mm. that uh, I would have brought, but it's stuff, stuff full of memory foam, so it won't be back. But um, yeah, that's my baby. We want to talk about a guitar. That's an amazing guitar. And, uh, and I've written most of my songs on that guitar. So that, that's the go-to instrument, is that 56 gill? Definitely. So when you write all those jingles and stuff like Maybelline and such like that, was it all that 56 gill? Well, it's hard to remember. You know, that's why I'm all back. And um, the the guy, the, we were in committee, and there would be, you know, a keyboard player or, or a guitar player or both. And then there'd usually be an ad guy present with, with some kind of either, you know, Midland copy, uh, some ideas about the jingle and we'd kind of polish them up and uh, you know make them make them shine so uh, it, it, it was in committee it's, it's hard to say from one day to the next because they had a studio full of instruments it's hard to say which or what I would use it on so they, they, they just had a buffet of musical equipment exactly yeah so how did you get into the, the jingle business was it something you just stumbled upon? As a, as a guy uh, became an employee 
slash associate with uh, named Jim Hodges, who uh, ran a tight ship and real creative guy. And uh, he just kept them coming back. He had, uh, there were lots of bells and whistles to his organization. A real, a real nice facility, studio, and we were kind of a, we did a lot of stuff, you know, custom stuff, custom production for artists and stuff like that. But uh, bread and butter was definitely uh, Jingles, and he he was good at getting people in and bringing them back. And so that that was that was good enough money that it was kind of a trap. I was there for a lot of years. Yeah, yeah, Still writing songs, always writing songs, but uh, they weren't going anywhere. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question, but you just answered it. You know, you know, how long were you in the jingle process? But you must have been making some uh, decent money out of it to stay in it that long. It, it, it was irresistible. <laughs> and and the, the working in, in, a, in an environment, a really nice studio. I thought I was pretty lucky, you know, to, to be in a situation to do something like that day in and day out. Um, was it like a normal nine to five job? You show up to the studio, hmm. and they're like, you know, Adele, there's a stack of paperwork over there, just different words, write some jingles, or anything like that, or it's more like 10 a.m. to like 4 a.m. sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes just almost like around the clock. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was kind of basically whenever a client would come in and, and or something of that nature, and then you would write a jingle for them. Um, yeah, and they they tell they tell us you know we want something like this only we don't want to get sued, so they would uh, uh, there's everything from as far field as uh, you know uh, reggae stuff, ones that like this and, and, and uh, something that they'd say well this this Joe Cocker deal that you know it we don't want to sound too much like it. I remember several instances where there were songs and we just kind of dance around it and we were really good at, at, at doing something really close and yet they weren't going to be able to, you know, copyright infringement or anybody come, come after us. Right. One time, one time I did a David Bowie impersonation. That was, that was, you know, I, I never knew what I was going to have to do from day in and day out. But that's part of the fun, you know, was, uh, getting to do something, something really radically different from, from session to session. Something that's out of the box. Uh -huh. Something that's out of the box. I tell a lot of musicians, that, I, that I've met here in the last, you know, last couple of years is you got to be willing to do something out of your out of the box, your your comfort zone, so you can grow musically. Yeah, well, that became once I got to Nashville, that that became a little bit of a problem. I had to uh, will myself into a, a kind of a box because, uh, and, and I, you know, instinctively I, I knew this because um, what the guy at BMI told me he said, son, we. We sell a lot of trucks, and this is like metaphorical. We sell a lot of trucks in Nashville. We don't sell a lot of Cadillac, boy. You know, and so I knew to, to kind of keep it in the ballpark, you know, with, with country and stuff. Which I, you know, I, I was I was good at country. And we can do that. And so, uh, yeah, uh, we were so much outside the box. It, they got a, it took a while to get me kind of back in point once I got to Nashville. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about you, you just said you just got to Nashville. So, what set you on the road towards Nashville? And how old were you when, when you decided to make the journey to Nashville? Well, I, I got there. I got there kind of on time, but late, late, and like I was in my mid thirties. And you know, they're looking for young hat acts out there. But uh, Garth Brooks was hitting the long ball, and and uh, there was. Uh, you know, that was when, when he was going and it was just, wow, you can, you know, that, that's what was amazing about Nashville is that uh, you can get in to see a lot of important people just walk in off the street. And that wasn't the way it was in L.A. or, or New York at, at all. You know, you, it was really hard to see anybody that had any bearing on anything. And I didn't. But uh, in Nashville, it was clear right away. It was, it was my, my wife at the time's idea to go out there because she was kind of, she was really tired of what I was doing and, and uh, how things were going uh, and had been doing it a long time. So I said, okay. So we went down there for a visit and she had a job within hours. She was a teacher. And uh, and I found work because of, you know, playing keyboard. You know, there's a lot of great figures in Nashville, 
but uh, keyboard players were scarce at Kansas State. And so I managed to get, I had a left hand, I could walk bass and stuff. And so I got, I, it was easier for me to find work than most people coming in just cold because I, I played keyboard too. And, I, um, and then at the same time during the day, you know, I'd be walking around, just walking in really established independent publishing companies and I, I got a deal with an independent public, uh, publishing company called uh, Powell Music Group and they had lots of hits and ended up at EMI which is just about the biggest, I think at the time they were the biggest uh, publishing company in Nashville, EMI. And uh, so I got some action out there, no hits uh, unfortunately, but uh, I, I got a shot. So at least you were able to make yourself a, a, a piece of living while you were there. Yep. Yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of musicians I know that went to uh, Nashville, you know, all, you know, all but one are back. And, you know, also said that they were able to starve to death when they got there. So it's good to hear because there is a lot of talent already there. So it's good to hear that you went there and you were able to survive. Well, I waited tables for a couple of weeks. Uh, I think that was the only really kind of day job that I had before. Uh, you know, I was playing and uh, and then and signed with an independent. So I had real good luck. Uh, people over, once again, uh, Nashville is, is pretty, it's still an open place. You're gonna get a shot out there even if you've got a day job and you're nobody. At least that's the way it was. I've heard that uh, Music Row is a, is a ghost town now or, or a tourist attraction or a tourist it's trap. Well, uh, yeah, wow. you know, it's an alleyway. <laughs> you know, basically, uh, I never, when I went to Nashville, of course, I, I was visiting, you know, so I kind of treated it as a tourist myself to look at everything, you know, when I went there. So, uh, but it helps making a lot of money when you're a multi-instrumentalist and you can play different instruments and if you can't get a gig on a guitar, you can get one on a bass or a, or a keyboard, per se, there in Nashville. That, that, was, that was a big help. I played for a long time at Opera, that hotel. And I, they, they had, man, they had four or five uh, pretty nice clubs in that hotel. It's huge. And uh, I played three of those. Was it four? It, it, it could be. I'm thinking back on it. And uh, I was in a, a couple of different bands and playing, played four of those places in there. And all, all the time playing keyboard. I, one time a guitar player got sick and I got to fill in for him. That was a, that was a week that I did get to play some guitar. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's outstanding. So, Doug, let, let, let's start talking about the, the first song we want to do for us to hear. Okay. Uh, what would be the name of that one? Uh, the name of it is, uh, I'd do anything to get her back. She'd do anything to get back at me. Okay. okay. But short name, anything to get her back. Okay, so here we have Doug Daddy play one of his original songs. Thank you. <laughs> Just to get her back. The first time we met, the first time we kissed, the first song we danced to, she remembers all the this. Lord, I'm back. Call her by an old flame's name, now she's all mad at me. And I'd do anything to get her back, she'd do anything to get back at me. She's up in arms, I'm down on my knees. Lord, I'm dying to make up. She don't think I've died enough. I'd do anything to get her back. I thought she was giving in, boy, I sure was glad. I turned off the TV, strutted across the den. But she closed and locked the bedroom door, would not let me in. And I'd do anything to get her back, she'd do anything to get back at me. She's up in arms, I'm down on my knees. Lord, I'm dying. She don't think I've died enough to do anything to get her back. 
back She'd do anything to get back at me Just one slip of my tongue And I'm in the doghouse She's calling me Frank She's calling me John Got me sleeping on the couch I'm dying to make up She don't think I've died enough I'd do anything to get her back She'd do anything to get back at me Sometimes three, but you know, used to throwing around ideas, and I had a list of song ideas that I come up with, and, and uh, a lot of times my ideas would get picked because they were saving their best ideas for somebody who was already going. You yeah, know, you knew the same two little list. And Charlie was real was real generous, but he came up with some some good stuff. One I'm going to do here in a little bit, but uh, but yeah, I had a great experience of working with some of Nashville's best. Riders, and uh, that was I wouldn't take for that experience for sure. But I do all right on my own. Uh, the next one I'm going to do is uh, that's one I made up. It's a, a story about in West Texas uh, rags to riches back to rags. This is boom and bust. That's Odessa all over again. And, and you guys, West Texas boys, you know all about that. I'm sure. Doug, when when uh, you were you were done with your uh, I guess your your journey within Nashville, how long did you re remain in Nashville before you said you know what I'm, I'm heading back to Texas? Okay, that's easy to explain. Well, one, my, my wife, we've been there eight years. My wife at the time she was really missing Texas, and I was too. Uh, yeah, and uh, there was sort of a unwritten but uh, well expressed. Uh, sentiment that once the, the big boy had had you and they couldn't make you big time then uh, it kind of, I don't know it, that, that was probably your shot that's, that's what I heard it, people uh, say in, in EMI's case uh, kind of got lost in 